Now we have uh, two journalists of multimedia and a driver were assaulted today in Kumasi when they went to a construction site to follow up on a story they were working on. Now, uh, Erastus Cesare Donko uh, is joining me on the line to tell us, to give us the account of what actually happened there uh, at the construction site. Uh, hello, Erastus, and uh, good evening to you. Good evening, Israel. All right, so what exactly happened at this construction site? Well, if you remember, uh, there was a disaster uh, some years back. Uh, the Malcolm building, which collapsed, uh, killed a lot of people. Uh, this building in Kumasi belongs to the same person, Nana in Kansabwadu. And if you know, per our checks at the Kumasi Metropolitan Assembly, the building, which has been standing for close to 18 years, does not have any permit from the assembly. That is coming from the city engineers in Kumasi as we speak. And so we were uh, quite um, worried that recently we found workers at the site. We found that they put uh, logs on the building and they were continuing with the construction works. So we decided as the watchdog of the society uh, to get back to city authorities to find out what has gone amiss. And so we went to the city engineer, we spoke with him, he said, they have even served them warning that they should stop work on that particular building. And so we decided per our work uh, to go to the site, speak with the workers there, whoever that is, find out from them why they are working, even when city authorities have told them uh, to stop working. So we entered the premises, we asked the workers there to see the foreman. They said we should wait, they are bringing in the foreman. And before we could say Jack, there is somebody from in there came, uh, grabbed Nana Yaojima here, uh, and then started struggling with him, and said that he has seen Nana Yaojima with a camera, and he thinks that uh, he's taking shots. And so uh, they, are, they are going to take him by the bull and, and wrestle with him, take the camera from him. He resisted, and then uh, they hold, got hold of the camera, pulled it by force, and then took it away. They uh, took the uh, microphone from me and, and took it to the Asuka police station. So before we realized, uh, there are two detectives in front of us asking us to come with them to the Asuka uh, district police station. There, we were detained. They told us that uh, we are under arrest, and uh, the charges they are giving us uh, our lawful entry and uh, uh, offensive conduct. Those are the charges. So we've written our statements, they've granted us bail, and here we are. Now, Erasto, so I want to understand, after they assaulted you, then they went to invite the police to come and arrest you. Exactly. Uh, in fact, they wrestled with us for close to 15 minutes. Uh, my driver here, Jim Agri, uh, he came in to assist, but they were like six people, and we were just three people. And so they were wrestling with us, and then at a point in time, they called somebody on phone. They said he's Nana and Kansa Bwadu. He owns that building, and he owns the building that collapsed in Accra as well. And so I spoke with him at length, and he said he was coming over. We should wait for him. But before we realized, there were two detectives at the entrance, and they told us, well, the people say you've entered here unlawfully, it's a private property, and so they have come to lodge a complaint, and we need you at the Asoka police station, and we had to go with them. So we went with them, and after a series of deliberations, they said we are under arrest, and so uh, they had taken our statements, they are granting us a self-recognizance bill, we should report at the police station uh, on Monday at 10 a.m., and, and, and that is it. So those are our charges. Erasmus, are you leaving, are we leaving the story at that or you intend to file a counter complaint because you are assaulted? Have you addressed, have you uh, mentioned that, reported that to the police? Well, currently uh, we are in touch. Uh, my boss, uh, uh, Saeed Ali Yaqub, uh, he has been with us all day. Uh, they have also gotten in touch with the management, uh, Mr. Jim Agla, and they are deciding on the next line of action uh, to take. We do understand that we are also to file uh, a, a counter report because then my cameraman here was assaulted 
and um, they manhandled him. They destroyed our equipment. The equipment is still uh, with the police as we speak. So we are also considering uh, something like that. Have you received any medical attention at all? Well, we just uh, came. They, they granted us bail around uh, 4.30 p.m. Uh, we came back to the office, had a meeting uh, with our management. So here we are, after speaking with you, we, there will be further uh, deliberations, and then we will know the line of action. All right, thank you very much, uh, Erastus Asari Donko, and we wish you all the best. And indeed, we will be following up on this uh, particular uh, story. Now, in other news, the police are seeking 13 more persons. They say were complicit in the murder of Major Maxwell Mahama on May 29 this year. Police prosecutors told the court here in the case of the 20 suspects already in custody for the crime, the 13 were also involved and need to be brought to book. Lawyers for the accused are meanwhile challenging accounts of the soldiers' lynching, which say the assemblyman for the area mobilized them all. Join us as Joseph Akable has a wrap of the court proceedings. So it's about 10 a.m. and all the accused persons are being led into the courtroom, 20 of them so far. Uh, two weeks ago, that number was at 19, but that number came to 20 after the accused person who is suspected to have retrieved the phone belonging to the deceased uh, was apprehended by the police force and also brought before the Accra Central District Court. That brings the number to 20, and those 20 individuals are being led into the courtroom. Hearing itself will take place upstairs. It's at one of the courtrooms upstairs uh, this is the block that houses quite a number of the district courts here in the capital and the hearing itself will take place upstairs where the accused persons will be led to uh, today we understand the police will try and consolidate the case of the individual they picked up together with the 19 others to put all 20 cases on a single docket so that is the situation for now here at the Accra Central District Court <laughs> did not last more than 25 minutes. A police prosecutor, DSP, George Amega, informed the court that they had first wanted to consolidate the charge sheet before the court. Now, they put all the 20 accused persons on a single charge sheet, bringing uh, that number to 20, like I pointed out. Now, this includes that individual who was charged individually uh, when he was brought over to the court, the person who the elite soldiers phone was retrieved from. So that was granted by Magistrate Ebenezer Kweku and Sir. DSP George Amega also informed the court about the fact that they had forwarded a duplicate docket over to the Attorney General's department for advice. But he also added that the police are on a manhunt for 13 other individuals whom they suspect took part in a murder of Army Major Maxwell Adamama, for which reason they were asking for additional time as the investigators go about their activities to try and apprehend these individuals. Magistrate Straight answer adjourned hearing to September 7 to allow for that advice from the Attorney General's Department to be received, as well as to allow uh, some more time for the police investigators to try to apprehend the accused persons they claim they are on a manhunt for. Uh, so, hearing of the matter will continue on September 7. As you can see behind me, the individuals were just moved into their van uh, that brings them to the courtroom each time and they are being taken away to police custody. Reporting for Joy News, my name is Joseph Akable from the Accra District Court. The ascension in the Upper East Regional Capital, Bogatanga, days after a chief city clash left one dead and two others injured. Business activities are said to have ground to a halt. Albert Sorry joins us live with the latest on the situation. Hello, Albert. First, tell us uh, the genesis of this clash at uh, Atu Babisi. Israel, we know that uh, for some time now uh, there's been a chief sensi dispute in that area. Uh, since uh, for the past two years or so, we've had uh, a situation where uh, two people are holding themselves out as the uh, chief of the Bolgatanga traditional area. And so on a number of occasions, there have been clashes. But on this particular occasion, uh, there was a, a court uh, case where um, the court was looking into a judicial, uh, a, a, a judicial committee um, setting that was looking into which one of the chiefs was eligible or not. And so at the end of the day, the judicial committee of the Bogatanga Regional House of Chiefs uh, named one of the chiefs 
um, what yes, it named one of the chiefs as not being eligible. And so the other one decided to pursue the matter at the high court. And eventually the high court quashed the uh, decision that was taken by the Judicial Committee of the Traditional House of Chiefs. And so on that day, uh, last week, Friday, uh, the people started jubilating the uh, supporters of that chief who um, the, the court ruled in favor of were jubilating. And then in the course of that, there were some clashes. Um, it happened in the night, so a lot of people uh, were unaware that such a thing had happened because when there were gunshots, people mistook the gunshots to be uh, some kind of uh, fireworks that they were using to celebrate um, the court's ruling on the matter. It turned out uh, a day later that uh, it was actually uh, some shooting between the, uh, the two um, factions in this chief fancy. Uh, matter. So, Abe, 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 what's the what's the very latest on the ground right now? Yes, the, the very latest is that um, military and police uh, patrols have been deployed to the area to um, make sure that reprisals or further attacks don't happen. Now, there were rumors of a curfew, but what I have been able to gather from the ground is that usually when it's getting very late, the security personnel block some of the roads to prevent people who are coming into the area because they don't want the situation where people will take advantage of the darkness to uh, cause uh, problems. And so they stop people from coming into the area. And because of that, the people who live in that area make sure that they either return early or if, if they are in the community and it's very late, they don't go out. So that is how the issue of the uh, curfew rumor came about. But there is no imposed curfew on the area. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Albert. Sorry. You're watching Join News Prime. We're taking a break. We have more stories coming up. Stay tuned. The Ghana Police Service says it will maintain a presence at the articulated track station at Averno here in Accra until absolute calm is restored to the area. It follows the deployment of officers there after violence which left a number of persons injured and property destroyed. John News' Maxwell Agbagba was at the scene of the violence early on Thursday and reports the residents are counting on the police to ensure there's no further outbreak of violence. It's some few hours after tensions escalated here at the articulated track station at Avenos. Police officers fully armed in bulletproof vests are also here on the ground making sure they are able to control the situation. Lots of the inhabitants here today are not really working. They've just lined up the streets watching and seeing how things would pan out here. It is a state of uneasy calm here on the streets of Aveno. The police a while ago nearly bundled a man into their vehicle. The man had said he was from the national security. After many verifications, it was confirmed that indeed he is with the national security. And I said, if you want to know the evidence, you can still take me to the office. Yeah, right. And I have my ID card. That one is for MPP from MPP head office in the East Indus. That one did yet. And I said, how about the national security ID card? They're not giving it. 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 They're not the violence that ensued on Wednesday afternoon left in its trail lots of destroyed properties. To register their anger, some of the people engaged in the field set some ties alight. This is just remnants of one of the many ties set ablaze here on the streets of Aveno. Eric Jomeku is a member of the Spare Pass Dealers Association here. They have been accused of instigating the violence that started Wednesday afternoon. People who claim they want peace, or they, who claim we, we are fighting them, they were all here before they came. Actually, the police, we are all fighting uh, over the, the police. But how can you benefit, what, what is it going to benefit us when you kill each other because of land? We came without, without land, so everybody will go with it, with empty hands. 
So why should we be fighting each other over this land? Uh, the group that is supporting the private developer developing the land here, they say they are ready to dialogue, but would not allow the spare parts dealers to take over their properties. The way they attack us and, and cut ties, if it's just looking for the front self and look here, if it started to bend, bend, and beat us, we run away, leave them, because they're the only weapons. We will not get nothing to fight for them. Massa, look this car, Massa. I bet, look this car. If them now catch bullets like that, guns, the jiva jiva take here. Wallah, Massa. So we run away. We will not fish stand self. Before they bring police people, they bring police people here say they want peace. Like we, they will not go grieve for them. The peace come, no, they will too talk. We say we they look peace. Lots of properties here at articulated track station at the Venom were touched. A vehicle belonging to a man who had parked it at a washing bay was set ablaze. Had been set ablaze. I asked him what, for what reason. Because I bought a car in the morning for the welder to fix some problem on the car. So I said, ah, why should this happen? And he told me, oh, there has been some riots around the area, and then people throwing stones and throwing some missiles. And then they said they smashed my car and then they set fire in the car. So I said, ah, why should this happen? Because the, car, the value of the car will be in excess of uh, 12 to 15,000 Ghana cities. Yeah. Yeah. My pen dry, I had some official documents, I had my books, and then I had uh, some few cash in the car, and then I had some ID cards. It totally bent. Well, the violence erupted Wednesday afternoon after some spare parts dealers and workers of a private developer clashed over a parcel of land. Director of Operations for the Greater Accra Police, Chief Superintendent Kwesi Fori, tells Joy News they have also been engaging the community leaders. We've been able to stabilize the situation. We've been able to restore law and order in the vicinity. Aside that, also, we engaged the community leaders and also drew the line for them that should they cross it, this is what we're going to do. And because looking at the terrain, a lot of travelers, huge number of people here, and the way they were pouring their petrol and circling it around the bus station area could cause something like mass murder. And we were so determined, you know, to make sure that we protect travelers and all manner of people doing business here. So let me use this opportunity to thank the community leaders, you know, for talking to the boys around here and who will be here to make sure that we continue to provide security until we deem it appropriate to leave. Okay. But regarding the conflict, we will advise them to resort to the court because it is a civil issue, property-related issue, and they should, you know, go to court and respect the laws of this country. Do you, do you foresee the situation escalating soon? Because um, we've seen some of the men here actually, um, you know, it looks like they're spoiling for a fight. Honestly, when we came, that's what we saw. Are you foreseeing anything like yes. that? Happening? Since. The conflict re erupted yesterday. I think, as uh, public order managers, we are monitoring the situation and making sure that police authority and primacy prevail here. Mm. Okay. And, and you have the necessary logistics to, you know, call any. You can see around that we have all the necessary logistics. The men are here, and yesterday night we beef up our strength here. Um, including the military okay. and um, so far so good this morning we will continue to engage them and talk to them our main aim in every operation our main aim was to secure the grounds here to avoid them burning the place you might have even had the petrol is all over here and the scent is all over and their main aim was to burn you know the buses the trucks and, and destroy properties here, but we've been able to secure the grounds. That is our first mission, protection of life and property. The minority in parliament is demanding the National Security Ministry outlines clear measures to keep the country safe in the wake of a travel advisory by the Canadian government warning of an imminent terrorist attack in Ghana. Addressing a media briefing outside parliament Wednesday night, the minority listed a number of such advisories by the U.S. and European governments as evidence of growing insecurity that needs to be dealt with. 
Minority spokesperson on foreign affairs, Samuel Kujetua Blanco, noted the advisory is most worrying. Canadian government, and they put this travel advisory up on May 30th, and as at August 2, that's today, 4.35 p.m., this travel advisory is still valid. And this is what they have to say about Ghana. Pickpocketing, purse snatching, and attacks by individuals on motorbikes are increasing in Accra and its surroundings, including areas around the High Commission of Canada. There is an increase in crime in Tema, Kumasi, and the Upper East and Upper West regions. Armed robberies of vehicles are a growing concern in areas such as Takradi, Kumasi, and other parts of the Ashanti region. People working in the mining industry should be particularly cautious. Armed attacks have also been reported along the Accra Tema and Accra to Kumasi to Tamale highways. You should remain vigilant at all times. Now, of all the travel advisories, this is the most worrying part. The Canadian government is saying, and I, and I, and I read, terrorism. There is a threat of terrorism. Terrorist targets could include shopping malls, government buildings, public areas such as bars, restaurants, hotels, and sites frequented by Westerners. Be aware of your surroundings in public places." Unquote. So as we speak, the Canadian government is telling its citizens who intend visiting Ghana that there is a looming terrorist attack. The Ghanaian people have not been told by our government, our national security, our defense ministry, our interior ministry, about this looming terror attack. We all do not wish that this will happen. We do not wish. But it does not mean that we should not take precaution. You cannot run a country on wishes and hopes. Every other country, what they do is that if there is, if there is a looming threat, the citizens are informed and citizens are asked to be cautious. Alerts are issued, and everybody is put on the necessary alert. If the Canadians are saying that there's a looming terrorism threat, is the Ghanaian government aware? And if they are aware, what are they doing about it? And why have they been silent? Why are they not telling the Ghanaian people about this looming threat? We're taking a break here on Joining News Prime to bring you business news. Please stay tuned. Hello again, good evening, and thank you very much for joining me on business. The Institute of Economic Affairs, IEA, is proposing a 1% increase in the VAT rate to help sustain government's free SHS policy. The Institute pitched this idea at a meeting with journalists on the mid-year budget review presented by the Finance Minister last Monday. Dr. Frankie Asaridonko is Director of Advocacy and Programme at the Institute of Economic Affairs. The sustainability of the free senior high school programme. And so, as at, at now, where we don't have funding raised locally, and depending on funding from outside, from donors and from aid, it is not sustainable. So if we can contribute 1% of that, and then somebody is going to support you, they will take us seriously that uh, we are ready to be supported. So yes, raising VAT will have some concerns uh, from everybody. But knowing that this particular uh, 1% rate is for the benefit of all children in Ghana to be able to go to school free from the first class to senior and secondary school. I think once the education goes on, uh, people will, I think, uh, buy into the idea. But that is only one aspect of the uh, areas that we can sustain this uh, project. Nobody wants to pay tax. But if you make the tax paying process easier, that I don't have to travel to go and pay my tax. So whatever I'm, I'm, I'm a business I'm engaged in, I can just uh, do a few minutes' work and pay my tax. Then the incentive will be there to pay the tax. But if nobody is going to create the environment for people, 
apart from only those who are engaged in civil service, public service, where your salary is taxed at the time you are paid, then there's no way we can go to increase the revenue. So government should put in mechanisms to make sure the tax collection is properly structured, that the watch seller, the cocoa seller, the carpenter, the driver, knows where to pay their tax, and it's so easy. Now, with effect from Monday, all exporters and importers who rely on GCNet for their transactions at the port will be engaged on a single electronic platform. This is a pilot program to test the systems for the implementation of the National Paperless Operations, which is scheduled to begin on September 1 this year. Program officer at GCNet, Carl Saki, revealed this to Joy Business when the Parliamentary Select Committee on Trade and Industry and Tourism paid a courtesy call on the company in Accra. Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Baramia has announced plans so far advanced for the implementation of the paperless port operation at the Tema port. This would mean clearing of goods at the country's ports will be done within four hours beginning 1st of September as government faces out procedures that cause undue delays, double inspections, processing of papers and other activities that impede the smooth running of the port should be a thing of the past when the paperless operation kicks in. The operator of the automation system, GCNet, confirms come August 7, the new system begins as it gets piloted at the port. The thing about the paperless is that a lot of the agencies involved, customs is used to paperless, uh, importers or declarants, they submit papers electronically already through the system. Uh, we, there are a few issues where we have to look at how to remove some of the papers in the system. So let's say you're going to the terminal operators, they don't accept, they, they are no longer going to ask you to bring a paper copy of the delivery order. They are going to depend on the electronic system to be able to go through that. And so those issues have already been ironed out and that's why we are confident the pilot is starting on the 7th. Now let me also put it on, say here that yesterday the vice president also came with a, the, there's a new directive from the vice president because uh, they also want to be involved in whatever is coming on. Uh, they also have their timelines. But it's not going to stop what we are doing because, you know, we are developers. Uh, we, we provide solutions. And so what we're doing is to marry the plans from the office of the vice president into ours, and then we'll continue the process. So. Chairman of the Select Committee on Trade, Industry and Tourism, Mafu Nana Ameniampong, expressed satisfaction with the work done so far by GCNet on the new system. GCNet is going to play a crucial role as far as this paperless uh, concept is concerned as tapos. I think we are impressed, except that there are a lot more we are going to advance with sport and those. As far as they are concerned, I think uh, we are very comfortable with what they've been able to put in place so far. Some of the uh, port operators, I mean exporters and importers, also com do complain that even though GCNet is doing well, there are other agencies too who are operating at the port, and it's like they are, doing, they are duplicating roles. What is going to happen to some of these agencies? Uh, actually, uh, that is uh, more or less the Ghanaian nature, which normally tends to sabotage a lot of these initiatives. That is why we, as a select committee from Parliament, we are here with them today. I think we have close to 28 days more to take off. So all those issues, hopefully by 1st September, I would have met most of those agencies to see what they can also do. Because if we want to wait for everybody to take off, we'll never get off. GCNet is expected to invest about $6 million in infrastructural upgrade as well as other related programs for the year. Now for the aviation sector, the president of the African Development Bank, AFDB, Akin Wumi Adesina, says the new Kutoka International Airport Terminal 3 project expected to be completed in May next year will boost job creation. The project, which is partly funded by the African Development Bank, aims at easing pressure on the two existing terminals and facilitate passenger handling and movement at the airport. The visiting AFDB president, currently on a working visit to the country was addressing some members of the press after a tour of the facility at the airport. The total cost of the Kotoka Terminal 3 expansion project is estimated at $274 million, which includes a $120 million loan from the African Development Bank. This makes it the first private sector investment by the bank in Ghana's transport sector. Addressing the press after a visit to the facility, President of the African Development Bank indicated the project is on schedule. 
uh, I'm particularly delighted because this terminal can actually hold, um, you know, uh, five million. Uh, you know, passengers per year, which is actually quite significant. Uh, when President uh, Akufo Addo spoke to me, he was talking of um, Ghana is back, and I think by the time you have an airport facility that can take five million people, passengers a year, that's fantastic. We're very pleased that this will help a lot the economy of Ghana. It will help a lot also in terms of regional integration. And we create a lot of jobs, as you can see, uh, absolutely here. So I'm very delighted to be here, and I want to highly commend all the staff that I've been working on this. Uh, they're right on time. Uh, the quality of the infrastructure is fantastic. And I understand in 270 days this will be ready. So uh, I can only hope to unveil it to you in 270 days to come through here. The new terminal is expected to handle up to 5 million passengers a year with an expansion potential of up to 6.5 million passengers. Minister for Aviation Cecilia Dapa emphasized her outfit is exploring ways to increase traffic to the facility. We are doing everything within our power to make sure we have uh, things put in place, uh, to make sure we mop up passengers along the West Coast, especially from Nigeria, to uh, use this as uh, an originating uh, traveling place. So I believe, you know, on the West Coast, we have at least 350 million people living in a sub-region. And I believe if we even take like 150 million traveling, Ghana's share could be maybe a quarter of that because of our strategic importance in the region. On his part, Minister for Finance Ken Ofriata was hopeful the development would attract further investment from the bank. Uh, it's been very good for us. I mean, this type of cooperation, as you can see, leads to things like this being manifested. Uh, we've talked a lot about aviation, we've talked about agriculture, we've talked about industry and energy. Um, and I think with uh, the type of performance he's seen here, we are sure to get more funding from him. The airport expansion supports the country's ambition to make Ghana a regional aviation hub. And on that note, we draw the curtains down business tonight. Many thanks for watching. My name is Imano Abuaji VIP. For more business news, log on to myjoinline.com slash business. Have a good evening. Welcome back to Joy News Friday. Now, Ghana Cocoa Board will be unable to construct any new cocoa roads this year. That's according to a report of Parliament's Finance Committee on the country's cocoa sector, which paints a rather grim picture of Cocoa Board's finances, largely blamed on unapproved expenditure sanctioned by former CEO Stephen Oponi of up to 3.5 billion Ghana CDs. The unapproved expenditures were mainly in the area of road construction between the 2014, between 2014 and 2017. Chairman of Parliament's Finance Committee, Dr. Marcus Ibeyabwa, and Deputy Finance Minister Kweku Kwating say the inability to fund the construction of new roads could impact severely on Cocoa Board's operations this year. They explained that currently Cocoa Board is distressed financially due to payments of outstanding contracts and services. Further, Cocoa Board is also servicing the payment of some facilities, including the payment of the Bui Dam loan. Therefore, paying the stamp duty would add further financial challenges to the board. For this uh, crop year, uh, not a peswa has been put into Cocoa Road, has been earmarked for Cocoa Road. Mr. Speaker, that was strategic. So much has happened in this area. And indeed, it is one of the things we are investigating, one of the reports we are investigating, is that cocoa roads have been constructed at Cantonment, right in the heart of Accra. And Medina. And Medina. And Medina. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, it is important that we get to the bottom of this report, sanitize, Sanitize the strategies for providing these cocoa roads and ensure that going forward, the money we put there would be value for money. Spokesperson on roads and transport Kwame Agboja is ever disputing the figures. Mr. Speaker, it is also true that 
reading from this report and from other information we have, Cocoa Board awarded projects beyond what they budgeted for. But Mr. Speaker, more worrying is that Cocoa Board hasn't made any allocation at all now for even projects that they have already awarded. Mr. Speaker, when my colleague was speaking, he, he used the word that confidential information he has got suggests that something, something went wrong in Cocoa Road. Mr. Speaker, let me say, say for a fact, these rumors have been flying around for, for a period of for some time now. Our committee have, uh, is urging Cocoa Board to complete their audit of Cocoa Road and let this country know exactly what happened. If I want to say this, the preliminary interaction we also had with Cocoa Board suggests that indeed Cocoa Board doesn't have 230 projects ongoing. It is not true. It's 199 projects. So this, this report, reporting 230 projects, it is, it's not true, Mr. Speaker. I want to say this to the world. I have evidence, privileged information that Cocoa Board does not have 230 projects awarded. They have less than 200 projects. We've mentioned it to them, but that is why when I started around I was very challenging my ruling. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I can... Hold on, hold on. Mr. Speaker, I am challenging my ruling. There's a procedure for challenging the... The Kasina Nankina Municipal Assembly at Navrungo in the Upper East Region says it has been able to intercept at least 150 bags of chemical fertilizer that would have been smuggled across the border to neighboring Burkina Faso just this year. According to the Municipal Chief Executive, the activities of smugglers is seriously hampering government's effort to support the agriculture sector in that area. Upper East Correspondent Albert Sore reports. Addressing assembly members at the first ordinary session of the Kasna Nankana Municipal Assembly, the chief executive, Williams Adum, said government's planting for food and jobs policy has already suffered a setback in the area due to delayed rains and the invasion of the fall army worm this year. He assured that his office has not given up on the agriculture sector despite the challenges. However, the activities of people he described as saboteurs continue to pose a serious challenge to the assembly. Every new mobilization, as we are all aware, is the lifeblood of any organization and must therefore not be toyed with. This is even more critical in the face of dwindling and erratic inflows from the national government, in the face of mounting indebtedness and responsibilities being placed on assemblies. It is now clear that if as an assembly we wish to live up to our responsibility, then we must lie on our eternal generator river, which as it stands out now cannot be described as good. The Kasina Nankana Municipal Chief Executive also said the Assembly has not been able to meet its target of internal revenue generation for the first half of this year. The UA cry by concerned residents of Nabrogo over numerous unauthorized structures that are dangerously cited on proposed routes, alleys and open spaces cannot be swept under the cap. We are bracing ourselves to take action to remedy the situation and no interference in the exercise will be entertained. I want us to discuss this intention dispassionately and come up with suggestions that will be useful for this exercise. This ordinary session of the Kasana Nankana Municipal Assembly is the first general meeting of all members of the Assembly since the MPP government came to office. The sector command of the Aflao Collection Point of the Ghana Revenue Authority issued a strict warning to commercial bike riders who help importers smuggle consignment into the country through an approved route to resist from such activities. The sector commander, Kafui Mode, who gave the warning, stressed riders who are caught in the act will be dealt with ruthlessly. The sector commander was speaking at the Tax Education Forum in Aflao and its environs in the Ketu South Municipality of the Volta region. The Ghana-Togo border is undoubtedly one of the busiest frontiers in the country. But increasingly, activities of smugglers are depriving the country the needed revenue. The Aflao Customs Sector Commander Kafui Modi 
urged community members to assist in the fight against smuggling in support of government's revenue mobilization efforts. She also warned commercial motor riders to ensure consignments they are contracted to carry are covered with necessary documents. And I will appeal to my brothers, those who use the motorbikes, those who use the, the motorking, and the others, the buses, please, before you carry someone's goods, make sure the person has the appropriate documents to cover the goods so that you do not get into trouble with the law. If you carry someone's goods without the appropriate papers, and for example, a gun, if you don't know what is in the goods, and a gun is found out, it is arrested, and we find out that you have a gun in there, the, the importer may deny knowledge of it, and you will be in trouble. So my advice to you is that don't go and pass an approved goods don't take or carry goods that do not have documents, customs documents on them. The Ketu South Municipal Chief Executive, Edem Elliot Amenowu, said he was committed to ensuring smuggling and other social vices are reduced in the municipality. And I will appeal to my brothers, those who use the motorbikes, those who use the the motorking and the others, the buses, please, before you carry someone's goods, make sure the person has the appropriate documents to cover the goods so that you do not get into trouble with the law. If you carry someone's goods without the appropriate papers, and for example, a gun, if you don't know what is in the goods, and a gun is found out, it is arrested, and we find out that you have a gun in there. The, the importer may deny knowledge of it, and you will be in trouble. So my advice to you is that don't go and pass an approved goods. Don't take or carry goods that do not have documents, customs documents on them. Bring international news next. The Ghana Committed Drivers Association is planning a demonstration against a controversial mandatory towing levy. The levy will see motorists pay between 10 CDs for motorbikes to 200 CDs each year, which will go into a fund that will finance the towing of vehicles that break down on country's roads. The levy has been widely opposed by the motoring public who are unhappy that they are being punished for someone else's irresponsibility. Charles Danso, who speaks for the Ghana Committed Drivers Association, says they are currently collecting signatures against the levy. They, they, the politicians who award contracts, they don't ply the road, they play, they, they ply by road, uh, the plane. So they, know, they don't know what is going on on the road. They are not going to help us. The law says, the, the road traffic regulation says, at, says uh, at a point, uh, regulation one is, is, they have to provide uh, rest stop points and lay by for, for, for the roads. It's not there. So if a trailer is driving, a trailer driver is plying the road and he's tired, he'll park alongside the road. And that car too is not disabled, so you can put triangle uh, at, the, at the back. So there are so many concerns to issue. We hear that uh, there's a collection of signatures that's happening uh, with respect to the uh, Yintia, uh, the levy. What, what, what's about that? Yeah, yeah, you see, they are always saying, Ghanaians say they should do it, they make consultation. That's why we want to prove them wrong that it's never like what they are saying. Let's say uh, the government workers, you see, if you 
tax a government worker to pay this premium without increasing their uh, salaries and then them? Is it not stress that you are putting on them? So we, uh, we have so a lot of things. So if you are listening to us or looking or you are watching us now, you have to sign. We will send a, a sheet to various uh, uh, radio stations and vantage points for you to go and sign, for us to tell them that this uh, implementation is all implementable. Charles Danso was speaking. We join you at a forum organized by Public Education Bureau to discuss the mandatory fee levy. Another group opposed to the levy is the Ghana Tanker Drivers Association, which has vowed not to pay. To the north, there is no rest stop for this trailer. So when the drivers are tired, what do you think they will be parking? On the road. And these are, what the, these are some of the causes of that. So what we are saying is the government should do rest stop for articulator people and then we the tanker. We are special. They should do our own special from the rest. In the event that this levy uh, comes into fruition, what would you do? Oh, Master, we will go on demonstration. That one there for sure. That one, and I'm not saying this, that only the tanker drivers, everybody must support so that we demonstrate and then tell the government that we will not pay. Actually, we've, we've come out with some signatories. We are signing some signatories. We are going around taking the sig sig uh, signatures. And then we will give it, we will write a petition and then give it to the people that we are the Ghanaians. So we are saying we will not pay. This is Yen Tuya. So the Yen Tuya demonstration will come on. Chairman of the Transport Committee in Parliament, Samuel Ayapai, has meanwhile blamed the media for misreporting that Parliament had endorsed the levy. He told the Public Education Bureau Forum Parliament has only given recommendations to be considered by the Ministry. National Road Safety Commission, through the Ministry of Transport, should submit to the committee by annual report. Every six minutes, we want to have reports from the National Road Safety Committee on the project and how effective the private operator is working. And that will give the committee the opportunity to properly monitor the activities of the service provider. So these are some of the recommendations that we asked the Minister of Transport to sit down with the service provider and see if they can do that and as a result implement the project and allow the project to come. Unfortunately, most of the media persons that it wasn't a planned press conference. After submitting the report to the minister and walk the minister through the report, I think the press got hint because of the minister came to parliament to answer questions and his answer said he's waiting for the parliamentary committee report for him to do the next action to take. They heard that the report has gotten to the minister. And I'm happy that our report has generated yet another debate in this cause that across the country we are all going to debate or better still discuss this project. And if there's any corrections or amendments do before the projects get started. Head of Communications at the National Road Safety Commission, Kwame Etuahene Kodria, has also justified the Commission's decision to introduce the mandatory road towing fee, arguing that it constitutes a major effort to reduce carnage on the country's roads. If you drive around town, chances are that you'll come across these obstructions. They may come in the form of broken down vehicles, accident vehicles, in some cases fallen trees, uh, or billboards, especially when you have very severe rainfall. Unfortunately, when these obstructions come within the carriageway, you often will have uh, difficulty having a sense of who exactly should take care of it because the agencies of state have their jobs cut out for them. But when these incidents result in, in crashes, you would you, agree that oftentimes it is a commission that is invited to provide one form of response or the other. 
So at some point in the past, we thought that we must begin to build certain partnerships in order, to, in order for us to be able to address these concerns. So one of the issues within these obstructions that make the use of the carriageway very challenging is one of broken down and accident vehicles. So when we started this discussion, I recall that at some point there was some observational study. We decided one day that let us travel the Kumasi route to have an, a sense of the problem. And on a bad day or on a good day, you could count close to 80 to 100 trucks broken down in very difficult sections of the road. Private legal practitioner Gary Nimaku says he suspects foul play in the deportation of his client and in the Indian business plan by the Interior Minister and the subsequent detention by the Immigration Service. Ashok Kumar Sivram was returning to the country after a high court declared his deportation by the Interior Minister null and void, but was detained by the Immigration Service. Lawyer Gary Nimaku, who has filed for a habeas corpus for the Immigration Service to give reasons for detaining his client as he finds it very curious that the service is disrespecting the court order. At the, at the way the, manner, the, the order was issued, and you look at the face of the order, you will see that the minister said that uh, Mr. Asimaram has provided a marriage certificate in support of his application for registration as a Ghanaian in 2015, and that certificate was fraudulent. And, that's a, and, that, and that it is criminal. And therefore, his presence in Ghana is not conducive to the public good. And therefore, he should be deported from Ghana and remain out of Ghana forthwith. Now, clearly, you will see that there has been a determination of fraud on the part of Mr. Hazibaram. Now, the central question that comes to mind as a lawyer that you must find out is that in determining that fraud, was the man given a hearing? Did you ask him to supply, supply with, with questions as what document you had in your possession? Two, the minister himself, does he have the power to determine that fraud that he claims to have determined? Because judicial power under Article 1253 lies with the judiciary. Yes, it does not lie with the minister. And therefore, if for some reason a minister in his decision or in his wisdom realizes that some document prima facie raises some questions of fraud, you put the documents together and put it before a court for a court to make a judicial pronouncement mm -hmm. after evidence has been taken and then the author of the self-fraud has been determined. But it does not lie in your mouth to sit in your office to do what you did. And it's so fundamental and so basic that before you make anything against anybody, you have to hear the person. Yeah. Did he hear the person before making the conclusion? No. In 2015, when you were raising these issues, there is evidence to show that this gentleman pointed to certain persons at KMA that showed, you know, showed them that these are the persons who gave me the certificate. They are in KMA. Have we gone to ask them the questions? When people are not giving viva voce as they're supposed to be giving, and which means that the rules of Audi Ultra and Patum have been breached, um, there are instances that people can get uh, some compensation from the court. Are you considering that? Oh, we are not interested in compensation at all. My interest really is not about taking compensation from the state or any monetary value or whatever, but uh, my, the surprise I had was that the court said, look, after the ruling, when the gentleman is coming, I said, my lord, so now, what is the effect of your ruling? He said, the effect of the ruling means that there is nothing there. The, judge, the order has been quashed, so he can come. I said, what if he, what, what if he stopped when he, when he is coming? And the court made it clear that that will be contempt of court. And yet, yesterday, when he entered the country, he had, you know, they, they stopped him, kept him at the, at the immigration, sorry, at the you know, airport, you know, uh, at the behest of who, I mean, those people. I mean, I don't understand. Now, pursuing a degree at any level in university is not a walk in the park. 
It becomes even more complex when you decide to study a Ghanaian language after years of receiving tuition, mainly in English. I have uh, Nanama Enima Yafia King Ting, defied all odds, to write her PhD dissertation in Chi and graduated from the University of Ghana this year with a doctorate. According to Dr. Enima Yafia King Ting, her love for teaching and casting news in Chi encouraged her to pursue a Master's of Philosophy in, in Ghanaian Language Studies and eventually a doctorate in the same field. Speaking to Joy News, Dr. Enima Yafia King Ting mentioned that a research paper centered on the political and social cultural discourse on radio and television. In my, in my childhood, you know, uh, when I was thinking about uh, my, my career, what I wanted to do or become in the future, I had always wanted to become a broadcaster. A broadcaster not presenting news in English, but in Akan. And of course, Chi, which is my mother tongue, yes. And I, I also aspire to become a teacher, yes, but a teacher of Chi language. So I took a lot of inspiration from my secondary school uh, Chi teacher, yes. And fortunately for me, when I got to the, I came to the university, I had other lecturers who, um, whose area of or, or field or area of study also, you know, has uh, some Akan background in it, and I took inspiration from there as well. Uh, so that also deepened the love and the passion to study the language to this uh, higher level. So, you know, the love to pursue Akan to a higher level started from childhood, you know. I, from outright from there, I, I, I had that... Um, let, I, I had that passion. On joining this agenda today, we find out how a state-sponsored real estate fund could help you own a home at a cheaper cost. Ghana's housing deficit keeps as Ghana's housing deficit keeps worsening by the day. The situation is terrible, mostly in the urban centres, as the search for jobs have compelled people to migrate from rural areas. But are you aware you can own a home without making full payment with the cost spread over many years? Well, the marketing director of Lakeside Estates, Lawrence D'Souza, is calling for a real estate fund which he believes will make mortgages attractive to Ghanaians by reducing the interest rates on them. Join us is Maxwell Agogo has been speaking with him and an opinion leader in Nima for the rest of the story. <laughs> I'm currently here at Nima, um, basically to find out what the housing situation is like um, here. Happening behind me right now are some kids who are back from school and enjoying a game of um, Ampe. But I'm here specifically um, to meet Yimano Jani. Yimano is actually a pensioner. He's a 67-year-old pensioner. He used to work with the Ministry of Defense um, as a cobbler. Emmanuel is an opinion leader here in this community. He's going to tell us exactly what it was like in the past and what the housing situation is like now here at Nima. A compound of livestock, beasley feeding, scattered household items, hey, amongst them a television set. Indications the family is in dire need of space as they continue to multiply. Over 15 people live here. Emmanuel Ajani, a pensioner, tells me the housing situation in Nima has worsened over the years and people continue to struggle for places. It is difficult to get a room here at Nima. You would have to go through an agent before you get a room to rent. You can't do it on your own, so you would need their help. Some people take three to four years advance payment, and some even charge as much as 650 CDs per month. Some people complain, but they have no choice. In the olden days, it was very easy getting rooms here. But five people came here recently in search of accommodation. I told them it is not possible, so they left. So what options are available for people like the five who have had to look elsewhere in the hunt for a place to lay their heads? 
I have met the marketing director for Lakeside Estates, Lawrence de Souza, in his office on the seventh floor of the Silver Star Towers. He makes a strong case for mortgages. It, you can rent somebody's house for 20 years, the house doesn't become yours. But with mortgage, you pay for 20 years and the house eventually becomes yours. So it is a, a good idea for our industry. Why then are people not rushing for options like this? Mr. D'Souza tells me high interest rates and low salary levels are major repelling factors. It's uh, the interest on mortgage. You see, a lot of the mortgage companies and uh, banks, they charge a minimum of 12 to 13 percent on the dollar. Then another major thing I realized is that salary levels in the country are generally very low. So by the time they add the interest and they do the assessment, a lot of people tend not to qualify for the mortgage. Either to, if you look at elsewhere, like the US, the Canadas, people pay as low as 3%, 2%. In his opinion, Ghana needs a real estate fund to make mortgages attractive, as that could help reduce the interest rates for prospective home buyers. Because speaking to a lot of uh, the mortgage companies, they will tell you that the cost of borrowing, basically they borrow and they also lend on to the, the, the potential home buyer. So if the person is borrowing at 6%, the person will add his or her overheads and everything. You realize that there's no way the person is going to borrow to the potential home buyer anything less than 12%. So if we we have a real estate fund where these banks could um, leverage on in order to borrow to homeowners, we can push the interest rates very low. Joy News.